What's up guys, Daniel here with Troy Kearns, millionaire real estate investor, businessman and YouTuber to get some insight into his journey and uh, get some insight into some of his experience so some of his experience can help you become financially free through business and real estate. Let's get right into it. So Troy, uh, how, when did you, you know, how did you kind of start out? Like what, you know, it looks like from watching a lot of your videos and stuff, you've been doing this for quite a while uh, in uh, real estate. And then I've, you know, heard some things like you might have some businesses and stuff. Like what was your journey, like getting started? Like how did you get into business? You know, what, where did you get the funds and stuff and the, to, to kind of start investing in real estate? And what was your, you know, journey starting out? I got my start in real estate the wrong way because back then, and this is 2004, 2005, and 2006 when I'm talking about back then, YouTube was in its infancy. There was nobody out there talking about, you know, you were going to seminars to learn about real estate in person from things you heard on the radio and you might get some of the substance. There's a lot of, now, there wasn't a lot of people undercovering things. There wasn't a lot of like fake guru things. You didn't know what you were seeing. Right. But I happen to have a buddy of mine, and if you've watched some of my videos, you've seen the math wizard. He's a mentor. Um, and I actually met him because my mom rented her house from him. And as I graduated college, he was changing out the doorknob of my house. <laughs> and that really stood out to me, obviously, because I had a nice, quick conversation with him. And that planted the seed for my real estate journey. And so I started looking for my first house, which was a condo in Renton. And then I ended up buying a house in Renton as my first flip. And then I really screwed up and I started buying stuff in Vegas when I lived in Washington on appreciation because I didn't know, I didn't know the principles of real estate, which is cash flow. I knew that my cousin was telling me he lived in Vegas that, Hey, the prices are going crazy. You can't lose. It's going up 30 to percent a year. The, the paper matched that, you know, what he's telling me. So what happened was I did what it stopped my career or started my career. And for me, it did both. <laughs> I bought two investments. I bought a brand new house that I'd never lived in a brand new house. I still have never lived in a brand new house, but I bought one as a rental for $310,000 in Vegas that I rented out for 1200 bucks a month and the mortgage was 2,500. Okay. okay. So you could do the math there. That's a $1,300 pre anything lost, okay? Just for them moving into the place, I'm losing 1,300 bucks a month, but it would be great because it's going up 30% a year, so who cares? Right. And uh, that's my thinking at the point in time, because I don't know anything. And then I bought another one, because the guy who was selling me, is like, okay, this guy's gonna buy one, he'll buy two. Hmm. And I asked him, would you buy these? He's like, yeah, I'll buy these, he's buying them. So he backed up my logic, ended up doing that, and I lost $2,500 per month on these two properties. Big problem. So I'm basically losing $30,000 a year waking up uh, before I even get started. And that's not even living. And so right. having that happen, and then I decided, kind of like the same reason I'm in Kansas City right now, I decided to move to Vegas because I had these real estate investments there. I was sick of Seattle. I felt there was a better opportunity for me in Vegas. So I moved down there, it was one of the best decisions I ever made. And I ended up becoming successful at selling real estate because that was when all the foreclosures started happening. And it does it, it seems like it was yesterday for me because I was an infant really in my business. And I got a break where I kind of BS'd my way into getting these accounts, like that I had the experience. And then the experience became me getting sure. the accounts. Sure. And I learned how to sell foreclosures and REOs. And that really began my journey of making money. Once I started making money, I had this problem of this negative cash flow that I'm still dealing with for like three years, two or three years, I'm dealing with, yeah. with this internal dilemma of my parents raised me to pay my bills. Mm -hmm. My parents made me, raised me to be responsible. My parents raised me not to walk away from my obligations. And I have these huge obligations that are stressing me out that I'm losing money on that I'm actually every dollar I have is going and then some is going to that investment. Right. And my first REO assignment, which is the foreclosure, yep. was a listing in that neighborhood that I paid for 310 and it was for 270. The same same oh, house I bought. Years. So I was already 40 grand down on what my first investment. At that time I'm struggling because I was drinking, just got out of college and I was okay. drinking too much. So I was like bad investments, bad decision making with the alcohol. 
Mm-hmm. And I'm like, man, I don't know what to do. And so um, quit drinking and everything got clear. I started making money and I'm like, well, I don't need to short sale. I don't need to foreclose because short sale would, I had to commit fraud, right? I have to say, I can't afford this. And right. I started making money now, so I could afford it. I started buying houses for cash because they were cheap in Vegas. And I started bridging that gap and I haven't stopped since. And solving the problems has helped me get to where I'm at today. Everything is a problem and I always focus on the solution. And that's just that's just kind of my story and I can, you know, take it from wherever you want to go after that. Sure. So what, so coming off of that, like, how did you, what were you doing to get the money in the first place to, to like buy those two, what the, the $300,000 properties, like, where did you, what were you doing is like either your day job or your primary income to afford right. those things. And then, the, and then the next investments. So good question. So yeah. Um, you know, obviously graduated college, mm-hmm. got an internship at a radio station. I, I was a big talk radio guy at that time. I liked to listen to talk radio, whether it was Rush Limbaugh or whether it was Howard Stern, I like to listen to those guys. And so I got a, I got an internship at a talk radio station and then I built that into my career, which is usually what you do after college. And I was like, now I'm gonna be the promotions director. So I got the promotions director job, but it was eight bucks an hour. Right. And, you know and so, um, you know, it's not, I, I, I don't like in the job. I love where I work. I just don't like the money I'm making, right? I had made a couple of friends, a couple of guys who were sales people there who were friends of mine you know, talking to them. And one of my guys like, man, you'd be a great salesperson. You should become a salesperson. So we, we literally had that conversation, like sitting in one of the parking lots. And so I was like, okay, that's what I'm gonna do. So good friend of mine still to this day, Jeff Sears, I've become a salesperson and that year number one, I beat everybody. Like I beat everybody like, and so I was obviously good at it. So I started making this money. So I made like $64,000 my first year in radio sales, which was great. I'd never made that money in my life. I think prior to that, I was working at Red Robin. I still worked at Red Robin during this radio job. So anyways, I made, the next year I made $215,000 at, at that. So I'm making a bunch of money, I'm looking to make investments. I'm investing in the stock market, 401k, all that stuff. Got enough money to put $30,000 down on a house. So I buy those houses. Mm-hmm. Got eighteen thousand dollars put down on the next house. Buy that house. You know, it was stated income back then. You know, tell them what you want yeah, to make, and you're and no verification, right? <laughs> but none. Yeah, and and so we got. I got those loans. I made some bad investments, and then had to figure out how to get out of those investments. And that's when I started buying houses for cash because they were such so cheap. Mm. And I didn't buy them like most people buy. Most people are like location, location, location. Now, right. remember, this is my, I'm brand new in real estate. <laughs> and it's, I mean, not brand new, but I'm a brand new agent and I just made a bunch of money because I'm selling REOs, right? Yes. So I'm, I'm the number, one of the top sales guy in Las Vegas for real estate sales. So that's, I made a lot of money from, in like four years, I made a lot of money because I, I sold hundreds and hundreds of houses a year. Right. So some commission checks were $300 and some commission checks were $30,000. Sure. So the sheer amount of volume I was doing made me a lot of money. And I started buying houses for cash and one led to two, two led to three, three led to four. And now I'm at 350 and 350 you know, units. I could tell you about how we got there, you know? <laughs> yeah. I'd love to hear that. I mean, I, and just to clarify, REOs do like our foreclosures, right? Yeah, so the way what an REO is called in the industry, when you're, uh, you know, when you're in real estate sales, you're generally working with traditional customers. This guy wants to buy a house or this guy wants to sell a house, whatever it is, it's traditional sale. REO stands for real estate owned right. on the accounting platform. So when the banks go to sell it, they call it their REO assets. Gotcha. So I was an REO agent, which basically means I sold foreclosures for banks. Okay. That's the that's only awesome. thing that's selling like 90% of the market, everybody knows you. Sure. <laughs> yeah, you probably built up a lot of contacts, a lot of referrals off that. Yeah, it built my it built my whole entire business that those years. Absolutely. And so, are you still, uh, you know, actively like selling real estate right now? Or are you just like a hundred percent into? I just posted uh, about this last night. I'm yeah. like, the best thing that happened to me was I moved to Kansas City too because yeah. I've had this identity crisis for the last like probably five years. Like I've been able for longer than five years to retire, but mm-hmm. I've still been like, what if the REOs come back? <laughs> like I've still kept my license and I've been active and still communicating with those people to try to get that business. And then I'm just like, you know what? It's time to walk away from the possibilities mm-hmm. of it coming back because keeping your head in that game is keeping me out of all the other games that I want to get in. So 
I was active as an agent up until last night. <laughs> oh, <laughs> really? I really decided, like, like I, I don't really sell for people anymore, but like when you were flipping, it would be nice to know like, hey, if I go on an appointment and I'm not gonna be able to get the deal, I can probably get a commission at least, Yeah. Right? So holding on to that was, you know, holding me back, just in my mind, not anywhere else, just in my mind. Yeah, you have to, you can only really focus on one thing at a time, you know, as your primary role. Yeah, I, I'll disagree with that a little bit. Okay. I, got a, I mean, I own a towing business. I own a bunch of other stuff too. I've got multiple things, but it's hard yes. to focus on things that are taking your brain space. That's a good point, yeah. So what, are, like is the towing business, are there other businesses are you like a passive investor in or, or you know, how is that working for you? <laughs> so my problem is, I, I, my wife says I'm a doer and a dreamer are my two biggest problems. I dream right. and I do. So yeah. it's, a good, it's a good combination, but like I got my car towed in Miami mm -hmm. and like that was enough of a seed to like plant a towing business in my brain. And when that opportunity arose and I worked it, I worked deals for a long time. I don't care if it takes me a long time. Mm -hmm. So I talked to those people about buying their, I bought the business, rebuilt it, okay. built a towing business. And, uh, you know, was towing a ton of cars all over town in Las Vegas, making lots of money for normal people. But yeah. really it's a very negative business. And I was getting a lot of negative press, mm. for, not for me, but for just my headspace. Yeah. Um, the uh, local governing body who regulates the towing industry is called the Nevada Transportation Authority in Las Vegas. And they're not nice guys. They think that yeah. business owners are criminals because they're all retired cops. Okay. And they treated me like a criminal. I, I honestly know what it feels like to be tre treated as a criminal because I felt like, I, and I literally spent about $70,000 with attorneys fighting these guys for, t for legal tows that I did. And that's when I realized, man, this business is, politics number one and number right. two i'd rather go back to real estate <laughs> yeah know? definitely a more positive vibe so um how did you go from you know one two you know three four etc cetera, etc cetera, all to 350 houses because i'm at me personally i have a duplex and a and i just bought another house and my goal is is a thousand units you know and to acquire it's a, a lot great of goal i would say make it bigger absolutely no it's because like i never had a goal of even 350 units like I just knew I wanted to be rich. Like, that, yeah. like the goal was just be rich, right? And then the stock market wasn't my play and that wasn't really working out. And so real estate, it be, just became easier. And I had been in the stock market for a long time, but real estate was easier, faster. So how did I scale? Mm -hmm. Well, time is on your side with real estate, as you know, right? So you start at 21 or whatever age you started. Mm -hmm. I started at 24, okay. but I bought bad investments, right? And nice. so I would say like, I felt like a little bit, I had to make up for lost time. And so because the houses were so cheap and because I was making so much money, I really was a competitive, I'm really, I'm a competitive guy. And another friend of mine was competing with me and uh, he was gonna <laughs> win. So uh, we were competing and I think he had bought 30 houses at that point in time and I was pushing 50 and then he qu kind of quit and sold all his stuff. And he says to this day, that was the single dumbest decision he's ever made in his life. And he's still an active agent in Los, or in, in Orlando. And when we talk about my portfolio, he's just like, I can't even believe I ever sold that stuff. Um, Cause he sold it like for 10 grand. It went up, he bought it for 25, it went up to 35, he sold it, you know? And now those yeah, assets that are, that are worth 25 are worth, you know, 300,000. You're right, especially now in a really, really hot market like this one just I looked for cheap markets you're in Smithville buying St. Joe they're five grand a piece they're ten grand a piece you know you might not seem like a long you know might not seem like the right play right now but in 10 years when you're 31 and you've got 50 houses in St. Joe that you are all in for for like a million bucks or whatever that you cobbled together I just believe that markets are great you know when the price goes up that's great mm -hmm. but cash flow is everything cash flow is king yeah and you know all these guys that talk to you about how many units they have or how much equity they have yeah like you said through accelerated depreciation which if i was your age you're, you should be pretty proud of yourself i didn't know what that was even five years maybe 10 years ago right like my accountant even told me he's like hey 
when I bought my first commercial building, he's like, you know, you can do, and he just didn't explain it to me the way I understood it. Right. And then finally I went to a bunch of seminars, heard that enough times. I'm like, oh, why didn't you tell me about this? He's like, I did. So basically through cost segregation, another good rule of thumb is you can take about 30% of the total building cost and write it off as a loss against your federal income taxes. That's okay. So okay. I made negative $229,000 last year. Okay. On paper. Right. Which means that allows me to carry back that loss to go recapture the tax dollars I paid in 2020, 2019, and 2018. If there was a, if I did pay money, I could carry that loss backwards to go and get that income. And is that, uh, is that law just for, is that just like a whole new set of laws in the tax code or is that just for a specific, specific period of time due to COVID? Uh, it's it's through the CARES Act, so I think okay. it's through a specific period of time for code, but you'd have to talk to your accountant. Sure, sure. What advice would you give to a young person like myself or somebody just getting into it? You know, what is the the first thing that you'd probably go do if you had to restart again and, and get into real estate if you, you know, and become financially free? Film everything. Film everything, okay. I didn't really believe in social media for, you know, I kind of ignored it for the last 10 years. And so, you know, my buddy Ryan Pineda really showed me the power of it. And okay. so that, that's who got me into it. And you can always learn from other people. So my biggest advice would be to get on YouTube and follow people who are smart and who are giving stuff away right now, like myself, you, like anybody who's got something to offer where you can learn something from, because that didn't exist, like I told you when I started. Sure. And it's because, people understand the power of their personal brand right now, which has never existed, like probably ever. Yeah, so now it's existing because of social media. So I think that the power of the personal brand, like we talked about earlier with my decision making ability with the bank, stuff mm -hmm. like that, all of that played a part of that. And so, cause I, I believe in my personal brand, I believe in my personal reputation mm -hmm. and so, being able to demonstrate that on your own through social media and through your knowledge base and through your network and stuff like that is a key element. Um, and then the biggest thing is would be to start right now. Do not wait another day. Do not wait another minute. Start right now. There is nothing that is stopping you. Like people are so freaking lazy. Like if they just called me up, I could give them money for trashing out houses. It's a, it's a living. You can make three, 400 bucks a day doing it, yeah. you know, and people are too lazy to do it. You know, they're just, they'd rather collect unemployment. So, you know, this firsthand. Yeah. Oh yeah, hundred percent. It's all about just your ability to get out and do the work. That kind of goes into my next point or next question is like, you know, what really motivated you to start your YouTube channel? And then why, what's your driving force behind doing it? You know, cause you're probably already I, I assume probably financially free at this point, you know, what is the, the motivation now? Yeah, I'm financially free except for I got a YouTube channel, right? Like, it, like literally my YouTube channel probably cost me about seven or $8,000 a month. Wow. Because I, I have three full-time editors, right? My was a long time ago was to make sure 100% be on the Forbes 400 list. That was the goal. And then I, then I took it a step back and I said, well, maybe that's not attainable, right? Maybe I can't be on the Forbes 400 list. Maybe that's not attainable. So I said, I'm gonna take, build a company and take it public. And I started looking at all these REITs and I'm like, wait, you know, Wall Street's just a debt instrument. I don't know if you know that. It's just a debt sure. instrument, right? It's other people financing other people's debt, whether it's Uber, whether it's this, whether it's that, it's other people financing other people's debts, mm -hmm. right? When I, when I, understood that I was like, well, I could take all my equity back out of my investments, mm -hmm. build a REIT and help people get real good returns because I'm not buying the stuff crap that these other guys are buying. I'm buying good stuff. Right. Like you're not making money on the, on the big mall that's sitting empty. These are just, the, the, most REITs are just set up for accounting purposes. And really they give, they give like a one or two, three, four percent re return really. Right, yeah, because you wouldn't you wouldn't need to take anything public if it, if it was all cash flowing and, and positive. So understand that Wall Street's a debt instrument, right? And that an initial public offering is saying, "Hey, I want to go public, and I want to want to build more, right?" Mm -hmm. And that's me saying, "Hey, these are all my assets. I want to go public right now, uh, and I'm basically doing a refinance with all these stockholders' money to take all my initial investment back out." at probably a diluted return because that's what Wall Street's all about. 
Right. So I'll get more money back from all my investments I made. Plus, I'll be able to control the shares of the company, grow it, and go after bigger investments. So that's why I got on YouTube. What has been the uh, the single biggest decision or event that has grown your net worth to date? Understanding cash flow. I, I could tell you like exactly the day it was when I was driving around in my car in Las Vegas, losing that money every month. And I'm listening to Rich Dad, Poor Dad Yeah. in my car on a CD. Remember those things? Yeah. <laughs> on a CD, listening to it. And I'd listened to it a bunch of times before. And it said, why would you ever buy something that doesn't put money in your pocket every month? And I'm like, and then I'm like, okay, I'm making money now. And then, you know, after you get into the whole YouTube thing, it's so much easier for you young guys these days to have access to that information that mm -hmm. it, to earn those high income skill sets that that it was a single biggest resonation was why would you ever buy a liability versus an asset and how can you turn every liability into an asset like right. so that's really i don't know if that helps you i don't know if that's a good answer but that's my answer no that's a really good answer yeah that's super great what, what are you doing to uh, to blow up on YouTube so fast? Because I, I mean, you're honestly like an inspiration for me a little bit because you're just putting out, you know, like one, two videos a day and you've blown up to like a thousand subscribers in six months. And I'm over here, you know, like and I, I'm not I've just recently really started to hammer on it. But, you know, still been sitting around I'm a competitor, man. Months. I am competing Absolutely. against myself. I feel like if I was really focused on it 100 percent, my wife called me on this today. She's like. You need to focus harder on it. Um, I'll get there faster. So just because I just moved across the country, mm -hmm. it's taken a little bit of a backseat for the last couple of weeks. But you know, it's really hard. It's a really hard. It's really hard to do. So if you're doing everything on your own, you're probably learning a lot better and smarter than I learned. Yeah, I'm trying to get help as much as I can. You know, because I've just one. I only have so many hours in the day, like yourself. But it, like you said, there's just certain you know constraints on your focus and time and stuff. Right, for sure. Um, well, cool. Well, thanks, Troy, and uh, I'll I'll let you hop off. I'm sure you got lots of stuff to do. All right, thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. All right, have a good day. See you.